Hello, Patreon supporters. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is uh, October 15, year 2023, and the time is about uh, 1.52 p.m. PDT, Pacific Daylight Time, and I hope you're doing well. Now, I've been applying myself for the past week diligently in exploring an area that um, I'm trying to get up to speed to. And I came up with some startling findings. This is going to be a big uh, a big reveal here. And I'm previewing it to you, the patron supporters. And uh, you notice I've been putting some, what do you call it, teaser uh, on this particular talk because I think it's so important that forego what I have already in the library of Patreon and go immediately to this one and watch it. I'm going to preview it for you here, and I think in a day or two, I'm going to be then give it to the two viewers or the YouTube people uh, who express such great concern over my well-being and uh, everything. They're just kind of hovering around like vultures waiting to see if I'm going to reappear, if I'm dead, or if the New World Order had gotten to me. Well, if the New World Order um, wants to get to me, they know where to find me. <laughs> and uh, it's not me that they have to worry about. And that's the nature of today's talk. That's the subject, the gist of my presentation today. If they have any group to worry about, it's Asians and Asian Americans, and I am one. But of the younger generation, the millennials, the post-millennials, or the post-post-millennials, the people who grew up in a radically different world than the boomers, such as myself, who look at the world, American specific, through a, a highly distorted lens of nostalgia, right? And I understand that. Um, I don't like to be constrained generationally. Professionally, I've always made it my, my wants, my... Um, my default to try to put myself in the position of the other. And it's difficult at times, I understand. It requires a lot of study, but I fortunately I have a, a vast professional background upon which to build. So that's all by way of saying that I'm relatively new to the study of cryptocurrency. And as you know by now, there are people who are 29 years old about ready to be imprisoned maybe after going on trial you know who i'm alluding to right or if you don't maybe you should stop turn this off right now and start going on to view and watching the backstory of the sam neil bankman freed fiasco uh it, it might have been a setup as i'll talk about a little bit later or read about it better read about it in the financial press the wall street journal <clears throat> the mainstream press in other words and also take a look at um, the um, younger generation who grew up with cryptocurrency and they grew up in an Asianized world, unlike the boomers, you know, who they look at me, the boomers look at me and they think I'm just fresh off the boat. You know, they don't understand that Asians have a, a history, a long history, as long as that, as long as their families from Europe. Right going way back when my family, it's not five generations. Me, I'm third generation American. So I'm telling you this because it's important if we want to challenge the system of social, economic, political inequality right now to, to listen to the outliers, quote unquote outliers, right? Because they're the one that has a message for, for us, for humanity whether we can execute, whether we can follow up correctly on their uh, message, right? Could it be the gospel of Jesus? It could be any any person with, with a in, set of insights. And I think this group that I'm going to be uh, talking about today does have some deep ins insights that you and I have to overcome our prejudice against, right? And if you want to look back, not now, but later on, but some of my previous presentations on praise of the the hipster, right? Generationally, there's all there's these conflicts and they're kind of artificially um, put into place now, just like the, the most of the other conflicts. Um, 
that we're seeing now that are engineered to take to take our focus away what's really important, and that's um, the, the sense of American national purpose and uh, even destiny. If I want to be sort of grandiloquent about it, the future. Let's just put it in more secular, prosaic terms: the future of America, because. None of us, I don't think, except those small stratum of plotters, and they are there. <laughs> um, let's not call them conspirators, right? But plotters are there who live off of inflation or benefit from the inflationary process they, that they put it into place purposely. It's engineered. It's not an act of God. It's not nature. And I'm kind of previewing for the people a little bit. Ahead of the curve here, uh, the, the major theme of this talk. And I have titled it, I think I'm, when I put it on uh, TubeU, uh, I'm going to call it the uh, Asian Challenge to Rothschild Banking. Let me say it again, the Asian Challenge to Rothschild Banking. Now, did I tell you this is going to be an important talk or not? All right, because you have generations now going back at least to Ezra Pound and Eustace Mullins when he was interviewing him at St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital about the Federal Reserve, right? And then you have G. Edward Griffin who came later and wrote the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. And you have all the repeaters and the, even the journalists, not journalists, journalists, because they're churning information over and over again, that I call them repeaters that are locked in to, oh, the Federal Reserve, all we do is got to get rid of it. Well, they never tell you how to do it. They just say, we're going to have a seminar on it. We're going to have a summit. We're going to have a gathering of all the great minds and, um, and rent our garments and weep and moan and talk about how Jesus overturned the table of the money lenders at the temple. Right? If you're not a newbie, you've heard these stories ad nauseum. Now, isn't it time to move ahead generationally, right? Move ahead intellectually, historically? Isn't it time we begin to radically challenge and understand what is meant by Rothschild banking? You think you know, we've given been given the stock description. Oh, it's fractional reserve banking. Oh, yeah, the Knights Templar found out a way that they can blah, blah, blah. And a trust, you know, you've heard about it all, and there's all these different plans or how you, you can mitigate uh, the ravages of inflation, which is built into the system, and usury, which is um, proscribed by most of the world's religions, right? But for some reason, the Bank of America is allowed to do it. And the state of uh, Delaware. Why is this? And how come all these bright minds who've gone to the B schools, the business schools, Wharton, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania, that orange man, Donald Trump, is so proud that he graduated at or near the top of his class at Wharton. Or Harvard business schools, you name it, whatever B school, you know, Stanford, whatever it is, how come the great minds there, the, the economists, the Nobel Prize, the economists, there's a woman that won the Nobel recently for discovering that women um, make less money than men at the workplace. Well, tell me something new. Where's my Nobel Prize? Where's my prize? Once you understand the argument that I'm making today. Now, I'm giving it to the patron people first because the YouTubers say, oh, come on, get to the point. You know, what, what's because because you're used to uh, TikTok, you know, you got a TikTok consciousness, right? You're, you're used to streaming. You're not used to thinking. You're used to the stream conscious. And that re-engineer, I'm getting off topic slightly, like I warned you, that type of engineered distraction is part of the process. So we got to get down to some basics here. Listen to what I have to say. Okay, let me say that for the third time, the Asian challenge to Rothschild banking. And again, put aside the prejudices that you come to this topic. In other words, don't tune out. Say, oh yeah, I know, I know. I got that. I've been there. I've done. That's the biggest 
challenge for anybody who's in education. The person who doesn't, not the person who doesn't know, but the person who thinks they know, right? Because they're all locked down in that. So, so for all you YouTubers who watch all these types of indie media, people with all these provocateurs, who are, as, I, as I've been stating lately, are contributing to the problem, not ameliorating it or eliminating it, but contributing it to you. They're selling storable foods to you, and a lot of fear and seminars and what everything short of fallout shelters. Maybe they'll start doing that as well. And, um, you know, it's called generically fear porn. And there are certain personalities that I've discussed before who have a, have a lock on those people. This tube you is not for you unless you're tired of hearing the same bromides about all oh, the Federal Reserve and the House of Rothschild, blah, 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 woof, woof. Okay, so I'm safe some time. Tune out. And better yet, do not subscribe to my Patreon, right? Because my Patreonistas are the ones who had some idea that I have something original to say other than these repeaters. the journalists backed by decades of professional experience, okay? I'm not a pop-up pundit. I don't even claim to be any type of pundit. I'm just a person who studies what I have come to call a cultural forensics. So with that caveat, let's move into it because I don't want this talk to last forever. I might have to break it into a two-part with all I've found recently. Um, and the third caveat I want to say is that if you think you know what crypto is and you think you know what's going on with uh, FTX and Samuel Bankman Freed and that whole show that's going on right now, uh, if you think you do fine, watch some other channel because my approach is going to be radically different. And it's going to be not just different, it's going to be importantly different. It could even change the nature of the American and maybe world political economic system as we know it. Yes, it sounds like a lot of hype. You've been to all the seminars. You've bought all the storable foods. You've listened to all the fear porn shows. You're talking, you've heard about all the chacoms are invading us. And, and you have all these um, Black Lives Matter. And these are all engineered, you know. And you're, you're, you're distracted by GLBTQ and all the retired colonels and retired generals who work for, for the so-called defense industry are saying, yeah, we got to go in there and help Israel, Beth Israel. Yeah, I'm against him. And them Arabs, you know, them Muzzies. We got we to gotta get in there. We got to send the fleet down there to the Mediterranean, right? This is not for you. This is for the people of the crypto generation, of the Bitcoin generation, the millennials, the free millennials, the hipsters. Okay, and I do have advantage because I taught for many years and I'm around young people all the time. I'm not a bunch of young people say, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're Japanese. Yeah, I was an army, I was a Navy brat and we were in Sasebo. Yeah, well, you know, I've been to Disneyland. There's lots of white people there, you know, or, see me on the street and trying to speak Japanese to and I know the language. Um, I didn't let this sort of uh, imposed idea of who I was supposed to be in American society hold me back, okay? And I'm telling you that because the, the two personalities that I'm gonna focus on today, Laura Shin, I think she's a Korean American, probably second generation. Uh, I, I taught these, you know, cohorts in my class. I taught Asian American studies for 21 years and they got rid of me because they wanted me to go with the Rothschild model. They wanted me to stick with the uh, Edomite Hazarian uh, dominant uh, university system and political economic uh, mechanism by which Roth Rothschild banking is held intact. So one of them is Laura Shin who has credentials that I'll talk about in a moment. And the other one is uh, someone whose presence has exploded on the interweb. Yes, I, call, I know it's called the internet, but I like to call it the interweb, just like Jay Leno's mother, right? People who, who, who don't understand, you know, electronic media or IT. Uh, irony is my 
my uh, part of my trade. Uh, and her name is Tiffany Fong. What a great name, Tiffany. Oh, it's breakfast at Tiffany's uh, combined with Fong. Okay, well, now again, I'm warning you, don't be thrown off by appearances, right? I fall prey to this all the time. She's cute. She's bright. She's brilliant. She's under 30. But she's a crypto specialist, as we'll talk about soon. But is she all that appears? We'll get into this, all right? And we'll also talk about a person, not in depth, that you might ne have never heard about because he's a Chinaman, right? His name is Changping Zhao, right? He's the guy who founded Binance. He's the guy, to put it simply, to simply oversimplify, he's the guy that busted out Samuel Bank Bankman Freed. He got it. He took down... FTX, they were buddies and they were playing, they were circling each other, sort of like the treasure of Sierra Madre. Remember that movie? Maybe you don't. You better watch it, right? There were scenes, who's going to fall asleep first and walk away with the gold? Now at the end, the gold dust just kind of drifts away. No one gets it, right? It's a brilliant film, All right? Check it out. But no one... Very few people have heard of Chang Ping Chao. Everybody's focused on SBF, Samuel Bankman Freed. Right? Why is that? Well, Chang Ping Chao is a <laughs> smartly, he's a Canadian citizen or a subject. He's hooked in with the British system. Maybe that might be cause for suspicion. I don't know. But that's not the point that I'm trying to make here is that this revolution, this possible, this pending, this incipient let's call it, this emerging, this inquit, new political econo economic system that is awaiting to be born out of the legacy of 200 years of Rothschild banking and all that is left in its wake, world wars, destruction, poverty, global inequality between North and South, even within prosperous, once prosperous countries, like the United States of America, you have these huge gulfs, these gaps in wealth. All right, you know, what's the, the general contours, I don't have to believe at the point. But how many of you are pinning it down to the fact that it is Asians and Asian Americans who are leading this revolution or incipient revolution, people like Chang Ping Zhao? And I'll look, try to validate because some of you will never believe me, right? Ah, oh, China, so they make a bunch of crap. They make a bunch of junk. Look at, there are 1 billion people who are totally propagandized by authoritarian governments and and they're, they're just creating disease. I mean, gosh, you know, even those people who like to laugh at CNN and MSNBC who are watching indie porn, right? I call those the channels indie porn. I don't have to name them. They're always blaming the China Comms for this and that. And I'm not saying they're pure as the driven snow, but I'm saying that you've got to recognize that the world has changed and you haven't changed with it. And if you don't, then America is doomed. The world is doomed unless you want to live another two centuries under digital Rothschild hegemony. All right, that's not good. So it's Asian driven. And we'll go back to, I could have called this, this talk tribute to Satoshi Nakamoto. And no, I'm not related to him. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Can you I've, I've talked to random boomers, you know, who grew up in the 1940s and 50s, and they were still remembering Pearl Harbor. And I said, oh, yeah, I know this one guy, like, Hey, you know, I don't know him. I don't know that person. Right? They expect me to. Out of 140 million Japanese people, they, they name check somebody. I'm supposed to know that person. If it's someone well known like uh, Nakadani Tatsuya, uh, Mihuni Toshiro, or Kurosawa Akira, yes, but I don't know Joe Sato. Okay. And I'm not, you know, I'm somewhat uh, steeped in it. And same with the other part of it. We, all the Chinese, the 1 billion Chinese people or 1 billion 
Asian Indians and around the world, they don't all know each other, all right? That comes from American television and movies and Netflix and Amazon, which figures into the story, by the way, because they're in a state of more than flux, but they're in a state of transformation. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but one of the reasons why all this Asian and Asian American talent is coming to the fore is because they don't have to go through Disney anymore. They don't have to do uh, watch Mulan or they don't have to watch these stupid sitcoms that I grew up in and wrote about in a book called Nervous Laughter or watch these, these fatuous movies like, uh, you know, Bachelor Party, whatever, Dr. Ken, whatever it is. You know, they're trying to queer the, in they meaning the controllers of dominant media, covert media, they're trying to queer the Asian American population. And that's what that's all about. Non-binary and all that stuff. I don't watch those movies. Um, and neither do Ch uh, Chinese people overseas. That, that says blocked. I'm not saying I believe in censorship, but they find it offensive that Americans uh, look at Asian people in such a way and they also understand that their abjection and their colonial domination under the British rule, to a certain extent later by Japan. Japan was, believe me, <laughs> don't believe me, um, who also been reviled for the for World War II and uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, they, they, the Japanese call it the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere and they meant it. What, what that means is free of British economic, political, economic, and ideological domination. But the Chinese leadership today have read my work. They understand the, the hardships of the Asian diaspora overseas people who've had to struggle with uh, exclusion, uh, removal, and uh, brutality on a, on a very basic level. Right? They understand that. And uh, they're not dwelling on it like they do in Asian American studies at UC Davis, right? One of the reasons why they got rid of me, because I said, I don't subscribe to the victimish model that's being propounded by Professor Stanley Sue and his sidekick, Nolan Zane, and his little minions. You want to talk about a civilizational level, Asian people have never really been under the heels of these world empires like they were into the British figured out how to mind fuck the population and feed those people with opium and dope them up. The same model that's going on in my United States of America. All right, so there's a lot, as you can tell, there's a lot at stake here when we have Changping Zhao cut to the quick to what is enslaving the world global political economic system for the sake of convenience, I'm calling it Rothschild banking. It's not just them, it's the people who've accepted and have benefited from that model of fractional reserve banking that we've heard ad nauseum from the, like there's some guy who made a documentary, it's a Hosea, Hosanna, a tribute to, to G. Edward Griffin, right? He deserves those um, accolades, she, word Griffin, don't, don't get me wrong. But again, it's, it's reinforcing a, um, a, a situation, a static situation that, that locks us into that model and doesn't get us anywhere. All right. So all proper respect to the creature from Jekyll Island, but we're moving beyond Jekyll Island. We're moving to the United States of America and all the beautiful people in it. A land of freedom and prosperity and a true shining beacon to peoples all over the world who we will welcome as motors, as generators of, a, of the new economy. They're doing it already. It's not gonna help if you subscribe to the demagogues who say, yeah, we gotta take those troops and send them down to the south of the border. Now, I have my own opinions on immigration, and I think it needs to be <clears throat> controlled in an orderly and systematic fashion and not benefit any one group. You know, I agree with, with that. The borders, that's one of the reasons why we have a nation state. The borders need to be 
maintained. And we've seen historically that uh, peoples have been brought into certain parts of certain regions in order to destabilize it. And you can pit the different ethnic groups against each other for divide and rule. That's right out of the British colonial playbook. They're always chopping up countries and divided between North Vietnam and South Vietnam or North Korea and South Korea and finally East Pakistan, West Pakistan. That's part of the rule. But what what is the motivation? It's the Rothschild banking system, which will finance that state of permanent political economic chaos, right? I'm not saying Zhang Peng Zha has, a, has the cure to um, to uh, international geopolitical conflict, but I'm saying that for the first time on a, on a huge level, beyond that of hand wringing and saying, oh, you know, we got to get rid of the Federal Reserve in Russia. He's done something about it. He founded a company, Bitnet. Um, Binance, which we'll get to in a moment. So these are largely Asian, and he's Asian Canadian. He's a Chinese Canadian. He immigrated. I'll show you a clip here about his background. This is going to be a long, long show. So if um, if you want a quick fix, if uh, you want to just go straight to Tiffany Fong and you know play with yourself, you know just just go right ahead because um, this piece here is meant to be analytical, right? not that it's without its prurient, salacious content to it. After all, um, um, Martin Shkreli, I'm not sure if he's a Croatian, um, Albanian, crypto, he's called uh, what, uh, crypto bro? Yeah, he served like a seven year stretch in the federal penitentiary for a crypto crime. The, the, the Rothschild banking system, which means the Rothschild justice system is is very much interested in making sure none of these guys, like Martin Scarelli, I'm mispronouncing his name, I'm sorry. I just learned about him a couple of days ago through Tiffany Fong, of all people, are a threat to this order. And I'll talk about him maybe in a separate talk, but, but today I'm gonna to be talking about the Asians who are destabilizing the Rothschild banking empire, uh, Rothschild hegemony. Um, Some of you, just for those of you who are completely new to this, you might remember something about, uh, oh, Satoshi Nakamoto, right? And in 2019, some reporter supposedly found out the identity. This has been a big hunt for the past several years. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? So they supposedly found this poor guy. He was living in LA. His name's, his, uh, in English, is Dorian. Nakamoto, his on his birth certificate says Satoshi, which is not an unusual name. And Nakamoto is not an uncommon family name uh, in Japan. So the odds of, of there being another Satoshi Nakamoto are not stacked against him, right? So they found him, the injuries, I'm not, and they he he denied being him. And uh, that hubbub blew over. So he's a legendary guy, but he's really the sort of the opening shot, if you will, in this war against uh, Rothschild banking. And whether you, if he, if he, whether he's a real person or not, it's really irrelevant. What his real identity is, that's secondary, right? We all have our guesses and there's been papers written about it. Experts have chimed in and weighed in on who it might be. Uh, I have my own opinion, which doesn't really matter at this point, but, but because I want to underscore the point is they all got set off by a guy with a Japanese quote unquote identity, an Asian identity. He, whoever he is, okay, he suspend um, disbelief, right? Whoever authored the paper Bitcoin, what is it? Yeah, the exact title was Bitcoin, a peer to peer electronic cash system was published in 2008, whoever it is, was the conceptual theoretical genius who said this is, and they didn't do it explicitly, they're smarter than that. They said, but this is going to undermine, if not eliminate the fractional reserve, what I call Rothschild banking system, so that we can have true 
uh, altruism, right? Bankman Freed and Ellison and all that, and the people at Stanford and MIT and the, the business schools, and uh, they're, they're covering up their, their avarice and their commitment to the fractional reserve scam economy, right? The Rothschild economy by saying, oh, we're, we're going to start this effective altruism club. If you know what I mean by it, just just watch the YouTubes on it. Right, because they're millennials and they're they're supposed to be for downtrodden uh, Asiatics and Orientals and brown and black people, right? They're supposed to be against anti-Arab and anti -Muslim. and they're for BLT, you know, and and also BLM and for gay lift. They're for everything that makes humanity free, but really, what they're invested in is the Rothschild banking system. They call it. Yeah, you, we saw how effective their altruism is, right? You want the, the details, just look at uh, the various pop-up pundits who are on YouTube trying to explain what went down. I'm not going to bore you with those details, right? I'm going to the quick saying that Chang Ping Chao and some of the other Asians who've gone rogue, Asian Americans, are the avant-garde, the leading edge to this overthrow of the Rothschild model, which is in serious trouble of its own accord, of its own making, of its own engineered self-demise, auto-destruction. It was simply Asian and Asian American intellect and in, in conceptualization and expertise in STEM, right? The science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They studied it. Right, as a matter of national policy, the brightest of, of mostly men, but now more and more women in India were recruited across a population of 1 billion and sent to the Indian Tech Institute of Technology, right, to teach them these skills. And they go back millennial talking about mathematics and skills and physics. A lot of what we call, you know, mathematics and physics, it really comes from that, the Aryan peoples. These are Indians, right? I'm not talking about the Germans and Nazis, you know, people who appropriated the Aryan identity, right? So they've been at it for millennia. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what the Hazars have to compete with. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's what the Hazars who are behind the, the Edomite Hazarians, the uh, Erev Rav Hazarians, that's what they're competing against right now. And they don't even know it. By the way, if you want the real scoop lowdown and you're a professional, either a consulting or team, contact me directly and I will um, I will uh, tell you what my, my fee schedule is, right? I'm just doing here for, for the ordinary average American to understand the larger uh, geopolitical and historical transformation that's taking place that's affecting their lives right now, right? But if... Um, you're a specialist in this, whether you're dealing with financial instruments or whatever it is, or you're a journalist or an author who needs help in this area that I have ample demonstrated exp expertise in. I'm giving away a teaser here. This is not the sum total of Get in touch with me. All right. Uh, my rates are about th the same as that of uh, Samuel Bankman Freed's primary attorneys. That's 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 the world I dwell in, okay? Just so you know, because when people get stuff free, they think it's cheap and they think it's not worth anything. But if you're a professional, you're a filmmaker, documentary person, hit me on the socials <laughs> and we'll sit down real, really, I'll give you the, I'll give you my A game. This is not my A game. All right. Uh, you know, I like pickup games, pickup basketball. It's fun. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's recreational for me, but, um, it's when it, when it comes real game time, it's, uh, serious. Uh, you want the W up there on the scoreboard and in basketball, you only got to win by one point and you're a winner. All right. Um, so let's move on here. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Let's play. Let's show you how um, clueless Anderson CIA Cooper was not too long ago. And all these experts, all these people who are on the network, how come they don't have any yellow people 
why don't they have me on CNN and NBC breaking it down? They don't, they, they have their heads up there, you know what? It's because they don't see us other than this little box that they've drawn around us as uh, programmers or people in the laboratory or the pharmacist at the local CVS or your family doctor. And I'm not putting it down because that's where we excel in all these high income areas. That's why Asian American in general are have a higher than average income. And this is why um, we're, as a group, are being suppressed by the Ivy League colleges, which are run by Edomite Hazarian banking interests, by the way, all the way to the top. Which is ironic because they were the ones who were excluded from the white Anglo Saxon elite white shoe boy schools of Yale and Harvard. They had to start their own university, Brandeis University, because Jews were kept out of the Ivies because they were coming in to learn of the secrets of power, influence, and cultural forensics, if you will, that tradition. And they begin to not only excel, but to exceed, not just by talent alone, but by infusions of big money coming in from their business interests, right, all the way from, you know, you name it, from, from the trouser pressers, as Joe Kennedy calls them, because he represents another ethnic tradition, the Irish mafia, right? The trouser pressers of the movie business, that's Joseph P. Kennedy's, characterization he wanted to bust into it but it was run mostly by immigrants from central europe that was their money machine and that money went into these larger institutions including academia so when i'm talking about the asian and asian american influence here i'm talking about a struggle against these obdurate these these institutions that have studiously tried to keep us out and there are some that have br broken through me being one of them, sort of as a amusement, maybe they call it affirmative action, they feel good about it, or there's some sort of missionary, and I don't know what it is. All I know is what my motivation is, right? My motivation is to make America an equal, equitable place, a truly city on the hill for everybody, right? Albanian, Croatian immigrants, you know, Martin Shkreli, and I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, his parents were both custodians, all right? They put his ass in jail for seven years. For what? For exposing the inequality of the medical care system and pharmaceuticals. Everybody hated him, not everybody. But the newspapers who are run by big pharma, such as Purdue, ah, those are the people that brought you OxyContin, by the way, right? Not the Jack Hams. And they've been fined for, you know, millions of dollars. They've got their names, the family, you know, the Sackler family, S-A-C-K-E-L-E-R, they are Edomite Kazarians, got their names taken off of the med school buildings. They put tons of money into it. They create these endowed professorships. They create these entire research tracks and they'll put one of their boys in there, right? Who they eventually rule out. They send him to Metropolitan Holding Center. He'll die. His name's Jeffrey Epstein. They'll build him up to tear him down, okay? And who's to say that, you know, the, the insurgent group mostly Chinese and South Asian Indians won't do the same. Just because they're of my ethnicity does not mean that they're good guys. All right, let me just make, get that straight. I'm not that stupid, I'm that simplistic. I know that social, economic, political inequality is a universal, it's in every country. And as we, enlightenment, people of the enlightenment of the Judaic, Christian, and Islamic faith who are against usury in our, our universalistic religions. You know, we, whether you subscribe to them or not, that is our moral compass, our moral core that, that needs to be brought 
back closer to this. I'm not never going to say it's been at the center. There's always been crooks and, and scam artists and grifters in American history. I mean, Herman Melville was writing about it. He wrote a short a novella, The Confidence Man. Moby Dick, man, that was like an epic about what America is and what it's been about. So I'm not a Pollyanna. I'm not a, a naive uh, person. I understand that. I understand the genocide. You know, Cristóbal Colombo, Columbus Day. And I know all the contributions of the Siciliani, all right? All the people, Blacks, and, you know, all of it. I understand that. My, my area is ethnic studies, you know, Asian American studies um, in particular. And I bring you this information here to show you that Alice, um, even though, um, what's his face? Anderson Cooper was born to the, to the manor born. He's a Vanderbilt, right? Remember the uh, the uh, Vanderbilt jeans, <laughs> the Gloria Vanderbilt scare of the 70s or 80s, or the jeans, scare jeans went from working class to haute couture, right? Anna Wintour says, she's a you know, British uh, operative, right? Who dictates what, what is haute couture, what's acceptable. Go home, you and, and that other woman who run uh, American publishing, like Trevor Noah too, I know you're colored and all that, but we really don't need you. You're 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 a, you're, a, you're an asset of a, of a, of the empire, right? That there's a reason why they put your sorry self up there um, to run these shows, right? To make to sell the idea of Rothschild banking to your fellows in South Africa and coloreds all over the, that's their term, not mine, all over the world. See how it, how it functions. They believe me. There are very smart people sit around the tables and, and go to parties, um, limited, exclusive parties, and they talk about what I'm telling you here, and they discuss it and they workshop it, right? And this never makes it to the classroom. This never makes it on their own shows. But th this is how it functions beneath the surface, right? So even if... Even um, Anderson Cooper, who comes from that lineage, the Vanderbilt bloodline, who they stuck on S CNN, is clueless when it comes to the revolution that's now underway. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, you can buy a very, you can buy a very small amount of a Bitcoin. Yes, it's called a Satoshi. Uh, named after the person who named did after this. the creator. So, who made Bitcoin? When you, when you ask about the creator, who created this? Who invented this? They must be a real genius. Everyone's like, we have no idea. Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi right? Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto is a fake name for somebody. It's the name that appears on the paper. Were you able to learn anything more about who Satoshi Nakamoto is? No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you try? A little, but really, I mean, it, it's just mission impossible. He's a myth. I mean, he, he doesn't, no one knows who he is. Some people have claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto, but we have not seen any definitive proof. People communicated by email with Satoshi. Laszlo Hunyat's one of the people in our story, has told us he communicated by email with Satoshi. Yes, I did. I corresponded with, with the event. Okay, maybe that gives you, if you're not, not familiar with the story, a little bit about the mystique of an Asian guy, an Oriental. Right, the ones that my generation grew up uh, seeing on Hogan's Hero as Fuji, the POW, or uh, George Gay Takei, right? Like I said, uh, the uh, people who run Hollywood are into queer, queering, and uh, they're into children. Not all of them, but some of the big shot callers. And they're engineering the culture right there. So you got guys like James Shigeta, who's a star of a uh, flower drum song. And I'm sure. Um, some of the big stars that you see today are the ones that are building, they're probably gay, they're in the, the part of the GLBT or non-binary movement as, as the price of admission for, for um, becoming uh, corporate media whores or stars, right? But there's a, there's a cohort of grouping, I don't know if they're gonna be, remain true to themselves, who have come to the fore. Um, and one of them is, I've already alluded to already, and she claims not to be under the employee of anybody except for a sponsor who runs um, a VPN, virtual network, privacy network, VPN, uh, which by the way, the Chinese use, <laughs> I was in China. And they, they, they see all the garbage that people in the movies and, and 
TV about supposedly Chinese people, right? Um, it's blocked there. Go to Vietnam, other countries, it's not, not as much of a problem. And by the way, I gave a talk on Netflix a couple of weeks ago. A lot of that is blocked around the country. I didn't want to give the, uh, around the world. I didn't want to give the impression that everybody gets free Netflix all over the world. And that's also, Netflix is also a tool of uh, cultural diplomacy, which I'll talk about later. It, it was, I didn't just do Netflix because I was bemoaning the fact that, that I was no longer going to get DVDs through the mail. The demise of Netflix is all part of what we're seeing right now. The implosion of a whole media system, right? And it's through chaos, right? Supposedly the, the character for, for chaos in um, kanji or kwangji in Mandarin, but in Japanese it's kanji, is supposed to be danger, but also opportunity. Two radicals combined. It's dangerous. Not, so, you know, it stands to reason why you've got some yellow people who see the danger and the chaos, but are making opportunity out of it, right? Wasn't, wasn't that the, uh, the ticket for the Rothschild bloodline? The Napoleonic Wars. You've heard the story all of, you know, over and over. You keep repeating it to yourself as if the problem is going to go away by, by intoning, oh, yeah. Lord Wellington, Rothschild, so the messenger was hit by a lightning and they found out that, that uh, Rothschild um, bought out the Bank of England. <laughs> I mean, it's all true, but uh, can we move on now? Okay, now here's how we move on. Here's how we move on. And again, there's a caveat here. I'm not saying that she is not an agent of influence, right? But I'm just saying that, again, the yellow people are paving the way, beginning with Satoshi Nakamoto. So here's Tiffany Fong to show you how she became an international crypto expert and celebrity and journalist. She bypassed all the people who spent all that money going to journalism school. Yeah, she went to USC, but she didn't go to the journalism school that I know of. She made her own career. She's not even 30 years old yet. Well, I'll let you tell her story. It's me, Tiff. And I was in a BBC documentary that came out a couple days ago. It's currently available to people in the UK. Uh, I obviously am in the United States, so I did use a VPN to access it, which I hope is not illegal. But uh, anyway, I did film the portions that I am in just in case anyone is curious to watch it. Um, in the documentary, I talk about how I got to know Sam Bakeman fried my visits to his house, and the fact that I was drunk on my first phone call with Sam Bakeman fried So if you feel like watching, I've compiled some clips for you and um, feel free to watch it. And I guess I'll link to the full documentary. If you're in the UK, you can watch it. Citizen journalist Tiffany Fong. I didn't have any money in FTX, but I uh, just messaged him and I believe I said something along the lines of, hey, obviously there's a lot in the news about FTX right now. Would you be willing to chat and tell me your side of the story? My name is Tiffany Fong. I'm a content creator, I guess. What's up guys? It's me, Tiff. I got into crypto really early, but I basically lost what was a lot of my life savings. And I just wanted somewhere to vent. <laughs> I'm not much of a YouTuber, but I did just get fucked by Celsius last week. And that's actually how I initially got in touch with Sam Bankman fried He started following me. And then on November 16th, I was actually on a date in New York City, just having some drinks. And then I checked my phone and I saw a DM from Sam Bankman fried I think he sent like one of those little hearts that was like a, arrow and a three and then said hey yeah i'd be happy to chat i'm free for the next hour or so <laughs> i showed it to my date and i was like what is happening right now and he was like go 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 home so i like ran home sort of tipsy and hopped on the phone with him i don't even know why you're talking to me it's not like i'm some big reporter or something like that <laughs> yeah it's i don't know like at the end of the day, I started to trust my gut a little bit on things like this. This was my first time ever interviewing anyone. And at the time of our phone call, Sam, I don't believe had spoken to anybody. So I was very nervous because I'm like, this is huge. But I think the biggest question I was curious about was just 
whether or not Sam was really this evil supervillain. There's something about a backdoor that allowed you to execute commands that could alter. Okay, you get kind of an idea of what uh, interested me about her. Like everybody else, she, she got a scoop. All she did, she was on the socials, as she called. Don't call it social media. That will date you. Call it the socials. Right? She was on the socials, and of course, it'd be SBF lives there on the socials, and found out about her started corresponding, and she got the interview. So we got to give her big ups for that. She's got initiative, right? Because she is, uh, is amongst a lot of yellow women and men, more men increasingly, who, by the way, should start their own medical uh, professional uh, corporate practices outside of Kaiser and all. I mean, like I said, if you are a business magnate or planner, hit, hit me up and we'll, we'll, we will talk about alternatives to the system. This is just a sort of an overview for, for generalists, okay? Because believe me, uh, this is not sufficient to get where we need to go as a nation, as a national economy. I told you the story about Jews being excluded from the Ivies and started their own university, Brandeis. Well, there's tons of money in Asian capital and Asian American capital. Why don't we do the same? Right. And I already came up with the name. It's going to be Fu University. Right after the dish, the Vietnamese dish, which I happen to really enjoy. I've eaten a lot of it, not just here in the U.S., but in Vietnam. Oh, man, it's good. Yeah, I'll call it Pho University. So all the graduates, the proud graduates, the Tiffany Fongs of the future, when they, when they ask them when they go to school, they don't have to say Stanford. They don't have to say Yale or Harvard, which is trying to suppress the Asian enrollment. They can say, yeah, I graduated from Pho U. <laughs> I'm also available as a Punjab writer for screenplays. I know you guys are on strike, right? The Screen Actors Guild and this, and the um, Actors Guild. You're on, and, and by the way, I should mention this. This is one of the reasons why these people are getting into YouTube. And a lot of actors and younger ones are going into it is because the studios like Netflix and Disney, the streamers, and now Amazon, which is streaming content, as they call it want to renegotiate the whole deal. They want to own that thing. They want to own your creative process. But since we yellow people, Asian, Asian American women are out anyway, are, are put into these gay films, these non-binary stupid films about the bachelor parties and crazy rich queer Asians, since we're relegated to that, so why don't we just do our own thing? Like Tiffany Fong, like our own universities. Right, and we'll, then we will break free from the Edomai Hazarian institutions that have been capitalized by international criminal networks. Right, and by the way, while I'm on the topic, this is another talk altogether, it's a whole channel, even. But the Edomai Hazarian people know that the top level gangsters. I want to talk about Meyer Lansky, you know, you know, the tough Jews. There's a book called Tough Jews, by the way written by a Jew, so, you know, it's not anti-Semitic. But they talk about the, the origins of the political economic rise of the uh, Jewish American population, you know, which is based on criminality. It's the same thing with Asians, man. Asian transnational criminal networks are huge, and they've been that way for 200 years. Right? And they're very sophisticated, and they're very good in finance. All right, so when I'm talking about you know, Mr. Zhao up in, in Canada, up in um, Vancouver, which has a huge overseas Chinese population, by the way. And they're of a certain ethnicity, just like I've been talking about the Edomai Hazarians. Right? I'm talking about a subset of what we call Chinese people or Han people. Specifically, they're known as Hakka. All right, the Hakka diaspora. They're everywhere around the world. Right? But most people say, oh, they're Chinese. 
or they're attack arms. Right? And I come from a background of ethnic racial studies, Asian American studies. So I understand the importance, the singular importance of, of ethnic, religio, uh, racial identity is in all of this. In fact, the guy that got thrown in, Albanian, Croatian, he's always talking about it. He doesn't want to be seen as a white guy. And I told you his parents were janitors, custodians, whereas Bankman Fried's parents are both law professors at Stanford, right? Carolyn Ellison's parents are professors at MIT of economics, right? So my new hero is Martin Squilly, crypto boy, king. <laughs> He's out now. He's out. He's out of prison. And anyway, that's another talk there. But he said when he was in prison, all that matters is a race. And it's this thing. And you squad up based on whether you were black, white, or whatever. He said, you know what? Bankman Fries going to have a lot of problems. See, this is in a conversation with Tiffany Fong. A good one, by the way. I'll, you watch it on your own. It's about it's over two hours long. Bankman Fries going to have a problem because there aren't very many Jews in federal lockup. They were going on low, um, you know, maybe low, the lower rungs, the farms, you know, the Martha Stewart type type arrangements, but he's not going to do that. Though. He's going to do, I won't say a hard time, but he, it's going to be very difficult, you know, unless it's uh, Michael Lewis's book. Is it Lewis? Whatever. The guy that writes on contemporary business. Unless there's a group of people that managed to compromise the system so much that they gave him some light time. Um, but guess who he has, they moved him into. They moved him in with the Asian floor up at the Metropolitan, right? Where Jeffrey Epstein supposedly died. <laughs> and there are not very many Asians in the federal prison either, man. They're mostly Latino or black, right? And white. So they have groups like that. And, and uh, a Jew like Bankman, even though he's non observant, is, is going to have a difficult time unless someone wants to sidle up to him and say, come on, SBF, give me some, give me some hints on crypto. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. All right. Um, let's move on here. Let's look at um, is it Mr. Zhao here. Oh, let's look at um, huh. Yeah, let's look at Mr. Zhao's history because we're running out of time. It's almost 50, at the 15 minutes mark, but and I, this is an appropriate break, right, for me to end. And I'll get in. I'll, I'll have to do a part two. There's there's much, much more to the saga. But I'm just kind of giving you sort of the backstory of how I got into it and realized the importance of the Asian and Asian American influence, not just as coders. And they try to get this guy Wong um, with FTX as a scapegoat, you know, He's low level. They have some South Asian guys running around. Um, you know, Bankman Free, he knew talent. He used it. Some of them were already on the stand. We don't hear much about them. In fact, we, we assume that they're mute, heavily accented Chinamen. And at least Tiffany Fong goes up there and goes, she's at the trial. She's there every day. And she gives us the human portion of who these players are. And just like, like uh, Mr. Wong or whoever these characters that are put on American media, including currently with crazy rich, gay, non-binary Asians, right? Which is not produced by Asian Americans. They're done. They're produced by even my Hazarians. Um, she manages to subvert that whole blackout, not censorship, but exclusion. Right, an exclusionary gesture. So let's return to the history of uh, Changping Zhao, done by a fellow ethnically the same Chinese person. And I think he's going to have a different take on it than some of these people. Oh, he's the worst person in the world. He's, he's destroying the, the banking and, and the, the whole crypto system. What they mean is that they're destroying the 
Rothschild banking system. Here we go. From China to Canada and finally to Malta, let's uncover how Chang Peng Zhao, the calm, somber, main man behind Binance, built the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Born in Jiangsu, China, to a teaching family, Chang Pen Zhao soon left the country to move to Vancouver, Canada in the 1980s. Zhao, in his early years, developed a strong work ethic with employment stints, flipping burgers at McDonald's and working the graveyard shift at a gas station, all to cover the expenses at home. A love for technology consumed him with the future Binance CEO enrolling in McGill University to study computer science. Working with the likes of the Tokyo Stock Exchange and Bloomberg Tradebook in their trade tech sphere in offices in London, New York, New Jersey, Zhao got a taste for both the financial world and the technology realm. His rise up the corporate ladder was very quick. At just 27, the Chinese-Canadian coder was promoted three times in less than 24 months and given the responsibility to manage teams in Asia, North America and Europe. In 2005, years before the Bitcoin white paper surfaced, Zhao up and left the trade tech world, moved to Shanghai and set up fusion systems, building trading systems for brokerage companies. CZ on learning about the wonders of the cryptocurrency and blockchain world while plying his luck in a game of poker was intrigued. The future CEO of the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world entered the decentralized currency realm via blockchain.info as the head of development with a focus on crypto wallets. Working with future cryptocurrency big names like Roger Veer Zhao moved into OKCoin OK as their chief technology officer, smoothening their fiat to crypto trade process. As 2017 was heating up with the ICO craze, Zhao finally pulled the trigger. He raised $15 million in Binance's 200 million token sale in July 2017, right before the Bitcoin market began to rise. In the following eight months since the launch, by April 2018, Binance became the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange by trading volume, with Zhao taking the third spot on the Forbes richest people in cryptocurrency list. Since their launch, Binance now boasts over 450 trading pairs with 155 coins, over 100 wallets and trading volume regularly above $1 billion. With the growing trend in initial exchange offerings or IEOs, Binance launched their own token sale platform, the Binance Launchpad, which has hosted several up-and-coming tokens leading to massive success. Starting off with the BitTorrent token sale in January of 2019, the tokens were sold out in less than 15 minutes. Since then, the platform has hosted the likes of Fetch, Seller, Matic and Harmony with significant price gains for each token. Binance introduced a Binance coin sent Okay, that gives you an overview. Obviously, this was done before the FTX uh, bust-out scheme uh, was, was revealed and uh, remains to be seen if... Um, Chang Ping Chao is going to be allowed to roam free with, with his innovative uh, challenge here. Now, I, I um, joined up here, started with a provocative um, argument, saying that there's this Asian challenge, maybe more specifically Chinese. And again, I don't know what this guy's background is. This is why I'm doing the ongoing research. They give a story that he worked in McDonald's and we're going to gas him. Who knows? His dad's probably a general for the Red Army, you know, the people. I don't know. We're going to have to find out. All right. This could be World War III, but it's not being fought by bullets. It's being fought by cryptocurrency. I don't know. 
it's very exciting though. I'm, I'm trying um, in investigating this um, uh, because it has to do with our, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, our economic, our social, our cultural survival. It's not just an intellectual problem for me, a professional problem. It's a personal problem. It's in it, and it's one that affects all. Americans and affects all people around the world. But I started out this talk saying that this is the uh, Asian challenge or Chinese challenge to Rothschild's centralized fractional reserve banking in a way that all these Alex Jones wannabes and Edward Griffin wannabes and all the repeaters, the journalists of Indy, you know, the, 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 the scare ranger or the people selling gold and silver um, all those people and storable foods and you're selling porn, going back to, you know, Ezra Pound, which I, I've given the talk on Ezra Pound. He's good for other reasons, in addition to first being really the first major intellectual to to understand the, the, the um, historical origins of fractional reserve banking and the uh, Federal Reserve, right, later picked up by Eustace Mullins and then on and on and on. But we're moving away from that. So just to re recap, why, what is it that precipitated my insight that my gosh, Jinping Zhao might be without saying as much, right? Without strutting around like, oh yeah, I know about the creature from Jekyll Island. Just in his gentlemanly way, challenging the very basis of Rothschild fractional reserve banking. He's asked disingenuously by some reporter, like CNBC, whatever, I'm going to show the clip in a moment. But, oh, there's all these rumors that you're going down. And he might. I don't know. I'm not a crypto expert and don't aspire to be. All right. And uh, this is what he answers. He says, we're not into fractional. Re Binance is, is not predicated on fractional reserve banking. And for even those people who are not that versed on the House of Rothschild and all this, that whole story that's being repeated ad nauseum by so-called indie media, so that we're locked into a perpetual spin cycle, you know what fractional reserve banking is. And he also knocks central banking. And even for those who are not versed on it, but have just heard your Gia word Griffin mantra, the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve. Okay, he knocks it down in one fell swoop. Let's take a look at it. And replay this over and over, share this video. This video is so important to the general public. Uh, an AMA, this is one of these ask me anything, you said there's no amount of withdrawals that would put us under, under any pressure. But that uh, I think was a, a very bold statement uh, to be making. How are people and why should people trust that their money is safe at this point? So I think the uh, thanks, Andrew, for having me. And um, the well-run crypto exchanges should hold user assets one to one. So user deposit Bitcoin, we hold it in Bitcoin, we move to a cold wallet, we keep some in the hot wallet. And people, um, they sell it. Now the Bitcoin belongs to somebody else, but we still hold it in the cold, cold storage. People can draw, withdraw 100% of the assets they have on Binance. We will not have an issue at, in any given day. So 100% um, of the users withdraw 100% of the assets, we, we'd be fine. This is very different for traditional financial people to understand because banks run on fractional reserves. And the traditional regulators, m many of them may think that it's okay for crypto businesses to be running on fractional reserves. That is not okay. Um, in crypto, there's no central bank printing money to bail out banks when there's a liquidity crunch. So um, crypto businesses have to hold user assets one to one. And that's what we do. It's very simple. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to take a little clip and post it on my Patreon site because that, that, need, that excerpt needs to be run over and over again. Did you hear what he said? The traditional bankers, and by that he means Rothschild banking, are run on fractional reserve. And the ones who went to a B school, the economists are on that model. Right, including uh, Caroline Ellison's uh, parents, who oh, they talk about the ethics of investing and all that, and ethical, you know, ethical uh, profit making and all that, which is really a cover for, for because you know you give money, 
you, you, in fact, you start up foundations and nonprofits in order to, to maintain your wealth and extend it, right? There's all different ways that you can uh, have the, uh, the the image of a benevolence, well, by, by taking even more for yourself. But he goes right to the quick. I want you to show this at Serbia, if nothing else, to all your friends and family. This is... Crypto, I'm not saying it's the, the end to all, but it's an attempt to cut the Gordian knot, the conundrum, the slavery of this, what I'm calling, or not, I didn't devise it, Rothschild banking, the Rothschild model. And uh, you figure out what the implications of that for, for the global economy will be, right? We will we'll only know, we'll find out. Uh, we do know that the current one's not functioning well, except for the top 0.00001%, whatever it might be, or the or the crooks like the, uh, well, I won't name them because they'll sue me for the tune of $25 million. But from all these professors at the elite schools who, who set up their children as front people for this, this huge, uh, these huge, these uh, huge, operations it's kind of amusing because i'm an academic right and um, i've always said hey, this place is the filthiest institution outside of the vatican as you um you can imagine under the guise of, of educating and, and research and all they do that they do that just like the vatican has important social religious functions i'm saying that um and i'm say, not saying that everybody is is corrupt okay don't don't get it twisted i i was committed to that system a long time but i've all all along i was i was doing an auto criticism and it got so loud and and and, and accurate spot on accurate the more i learned thanks to people like gia Gervin, by the way and eustace mullins and and uh, ezra pound and all the other people that i've been knocking today i learned from them i read their books Right. I read the literature, I watched those personalities, but I've seen that their gig, their whole deal has just become nothing but the monetization of fear. You like that phrase? The monetization of fear. I'm a wordsmith, baby. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to live in fear. You don't either. We want to live in relative prosperity and in health. And we want to create a new a, a renaissance or renaissance if you will right and it can happen but it's going to require a lot of people understanding this frame this larger framework all right ladies and gentlemen that's my time i don't uh, i was going to talk a little bit more about tiffany fong i'll see that for another time uh and i'll leave i'll leave it that i'm anxious to to do that one um, as well. That was, in fact, I, I, this original talk was going to be about Tiffany Fong specifically, but then I realized quickly that the story goes way beyond the personalities. So again, that's my last warning today. Don't don't get caught up in the personalities. All right. Look at the issues, personalities, bling, and all that stuff. All right. Look look at the issues behind it. And you'll be okay. That's my time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. And we'll see you, God willing, soon. Bye.